Do you believe that in four years, after 70 years of trying, we will finally have fusion power delivering electricity? Well, Microsoft does. They signed a power purchase agreement with Helion Energy to deliver 50 megawatts of power starting in 2029. Nucor is also bullish on Helion. They've signed an agreement with them to deliver 500 megawatts of electricity to make steel. Helion just raised another $400 million to add to the $600 million investments they have already raised. So some people with deep pockets think they're onto something. Are these investors crazy? Can it be that close? After saying that fusion is 30 years away, and it always will be, will we really have fusion powering data centers and making steel in just a few years? Or is this just another empty promise? Welcome to the third video in the Decarbonized series on fusion. If you aren't clear what fusion is, I recommend starting with my first video in this series. Today, we'll talk about Helion Energy, I think the most intriguing company in this space. That's because their approach is so different from everyone else's. Rather than deuterium and tritium for fuel, they plan to use deuterium and helium-3. Rather than contain the plasma in a magnetic donut or slam a pellet of fuel to implode it, they slam two magnetically contained plasma rings at each other. Rather than taking heat and converting it to steam and generating electricity with a turbine, they generate electricity directly. If you want to see an innovative approach to fusion power, you can't beat Helion. Unlike Commonwealth fusion systems that I spoke about in my previous video, they're not building their first prototype, but their seventh. Their approach is so innovative, they can't leverage decades of publicly funded research, but must figure out almost everything in-house. And yes, there has been some research into their approach, but a small fraction of what's been spent on tokamaks like Commonwealth Fusion or inertial confinement like First Light, which will be my next video. But Helion does have two things in common with Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Bold proclamations not backed up by data and a successful track record of raising money. They're taking that money and building Polaris, which aims to be the first fusion system to generate electricity. But Polaris will consume much more electricity than it generates, so this is not a commercial reactor, just a step in that direction. So let's look at Helion's approach, and we'll start with talking about the different possible fusion reactions. The most popular fusion reaction on Earth, by far, is based on the two forms of heavy hydrogen. Readily available deuterium, or D, a hydrogen nuclei with one proton and one neutron, and the much more difficult to obtain tritium, or T, with one proton and two neutrons. When the D and T fuse, you get a helium-4 nuclei and a single neutron. 80% of the energy is carried away by the uncharged neutron. Since the neutron is uncharged, it flies right out of a magnetic bottle, unaffected. In most reactors, it's slowed and then captured in some kind of liquid blanket like the fluorine lithium beryllium molten salt used by Commonwealth Fusion Systems. After depositing its heat in the blanket, the neutron is then captured by lithium-6, producing a tritium atom to be used as fuel. It may also be captured by the beryllium, which then emits two neutrons, increasing tritium production. The second reaction is to fuse two deuterium nuclei together in a DD reaction. But unfortunately, this reaction only emits about 20% of the energy of the DT reaction. Half of the time, you get a neutron and helium-3, and the neutron will escape the magnetic fields, and the energy will be lost. And half the time, you get a proton and tritium. Helion plans to use this reaction to generate the helium-3 they need which might be easier than mining it on the moon. Then we come to the third fusion reaction, the one helium plants use to generate electricity, deuterium and helium-3, which produces a proton and helium-4, and a bit more energy than the DT reaction. Since all of the reaction products are charged, that is, there are no neutrons, the energy stays inside the magnetic bottle. This is a bit of a simplification, since there will be emissions of X-rays through Bremsstrong radiation, 
which will escape the magnetic bottle because light is uncharged. The x-rays will strike the surface of the reactor and heat it, which will create thermal stresses on the structure and energy that won't be captured as electricity. Let's look at a plot that shows what helion is up against. It's the cross-section of the three fusion reactions that we've been talking about as a function of energy. The cross-section is a measure of the probability that fusion will happen with particles at this energy. As the particle's energy increases, their ability to overcome the Coulomb repulsion increases in all cases. This is a log plot, which means that each tick is a factor of 10. The x-axis is in kiloelectron volts, which is a unit beloved by physicists and only physicists. For now, you just need to understand that it will be difficult to reach all of these energies. Their sixth prototype, Trenta, achieved energies around 9 keV, too low to achieve deuterium-helium-3 reactions. Immediately, you can see that the energies that can be obtained the DT and DD cross-sections are much higher than the deuterium-helium-3 cross-section because both of the forms of hydrogen have a single proton. The deuterium-helium-3 reaction is fighting against twice the repulsion since helium has two protons. What this also means that if you have a plasma of deuterium and helium-3 as helion plans to, that you'll get a lot of DD reactions that produce very little energy but they will produce neutrons that need to be managed. They'll also produce helium-3 and tritium. Since deuterium is relatively inexpensive, as long as the neutron emissions are properly managed, this might not be a problem. There will just be a lot of reactions going on inside the chamber that aren't producing much useful energy. What I haven't talked about, what is so different about helion's approach, is how they create the hot, dense plasma, and how the energy is removed from the plasma and generates electricity. And it's brilliant, if it works. It's what's called field reverse configuration, or FRC, which is among the least useful names around. I'm sure it makes sense to a plasma physicist, but to this mere astrophysicist, the name means nothing. The Wikipedia article doesn't even attempt to explain what the name means but it's enormously cool. On one side of the machine, they inject the fuel as a cool gas, and they heat the gas enough that the particles of hydrogen and helium are ionized, and the gas becomes a plasma. Then the magnetic fields start to do their magic, turning the plasma into a rotating ring, then pushing and squeezing this ring until it's moving at a million miles an hour. On the opposite side of the reactor, the exact same thing is happening, and the two rings collide in the center. Magnetic fields squish this hot plasma into a hotter, denser plasma that reaches the densities and temperatures needed for fusion. As I said before, most of the fusion will be DD reactions and much of the energy will leave the reactor as neutrons. But if the temperature is high enough, some of it will be the deuterium helium-3 reactions and all of the products of that are charged and very hot. This hot plasma expands as hot gases do, and the expanding electrically charged plasma pushes against the magnetic fields, and this drives currents in the conductors that were used to generate the magnetic fields. The currents generated will be higher than those used to generate the magnetic fields that triggered the fusion in the first place, and those currents can be used to charge the capacitors that were used to trigger the reaction. If all goes well, the energy in the capacitors at the end of a pulse will exceed the energy that was used to generate the pulse. Some of this energy can be siphoned off and converted to AC power to send to the grid, while the rest of the energy is used to generate the next pulse. If this sounds immensely complex, it is. No one has ever built a power plant remotely like this. But the physics does pencil out. This isn't magic or make-believe, just really hard engineering. For instance, Helion has found that they can't buy capacitors that meet their needs, so they're making their own. And it could lead to a much smaller reactor because you don't need to boil water to generate steam to run through a turbine. That's actually a pretty clever way to make a peaker plant because you could theoretically turn it on and off very quickly. 
much more quickly than a thermal plant that needs to boil water. It might make sense to run the reactor with just deuterium when demand for electricity is low and produce helium-3, and then switch to deuterium helium-3 when electricity is needed. So let's look at Helion's sixth prototype, Trenta, which ran from 2020 to 2022. They performed over 10,000 shots. For Trenta, they just used deuterium as fuel as it's readily available and inexpensive, and it has a fairly high cross-section. The ions achieved an energy of 9 keV, not nearly hot enough for the deuterium-helium-3 reactions, but they did get fusion of deuterium and deuterium. As I said above, this isn't a good fuel. It doesn't generate a lot of energy, but it is good for running a prototype. They detected loads of neutrons, confirming that they were getting fusion. They showed that the nuclei were nine times hotter than the electrons. This might not sound important, but it actually is, because fusion is all about the energy in the nuclei, and the Bremsstrong radiation that I spoke of above comes from the electrons, so that the lower energy of the electrons means the plasma won't lose as much energy from Bremsstrong radiation as it would if they were at the same temperature as the nuclei. Helion is now building their seventh prototype, Polaris. They claim that Polaris will be able to burn deuterium deuterium, deuterium tritium, and even deuterium helium-3. Whether they're able to get to the temperatures needed to burn a significant amount of helium-3 remains to be seen, and I'm a bit skeptical. Assuming a fuel mix of 50% deuterium and 50% helium-3, they'd need to reach an energy of about 35 keV for 10% of the reactions to be with helium-3 almost four times the energy reached by Trenta. The rest of the reactions will be deuterium deuterium, which generate very little energy that can be captured by Polaris. They plan for the first time anywhere to actually capture energy from fusion and generate electricity. This energy will be less than what it takes to run the reactor, but it will prove in principle their plan to capture the energy of a hot plasma pushing against the magnetic fields that can work. Helan plans to shield their next prototype with a borated polyethylene and borated concrete shield to stop the neutrons. That protects the outside world, but not the reactor itself, will be, which will be inside the shield. I once worked on a medical device that was going to be inside a radiation therapy vault that was filled with neutrons. We tested the device and found that one of the components failed when it was exposed to neutrons. But luckily, there was a drop-in replacement that wasn't harmed by neutrons. Helion will have to go through their electronics and figure out what works and what doesn't. Neutrons make some metals radioactive or brittle, so they also have to be careful to avoid those elements. They haven't shared a lot of details of the status of Polaris, but they did share this video. It's clear they're not generating electricity with Polaris, or they'd be able to turn on the lights. The fact that they just raised $400 million suggests they had some good news to share with the investors, but not with the public. At the end, they show the glow, which I believe means they've achieved first plasma, but they're very coy. They have a commitment to deliver 50 megawatts of electricity to Microsoft by 2029, Given that that's four years from now, and they've never built a reactor that produces electricity, and the one they're building now will produce less than it consumes, and it takes about four years to build a reactor, which is remarkably fast, it's hard to see how they could possibly hit that deadline. They might, by defining delivering 50 megawatts of power, as it's sufficient for it to be operational for an hour a day then the device gets too hot, or maybe they run out of helium-3. And if they're able to do that before the end of the decade, I will be mightily impressed. But I wouldn't say they're delivering 50 megawatts of power. More realistic is that by about 2029, they have their eighth prototype running, and it produces more energy than it consumes. And the fact is, if they figure out their helium-3 supply chain, and how to build a reactor that can withstand the Bremstrong 
and neutron radiation and run for 20 hours a day by 2033, that would be huge. But it's not just about getting a single plant working, but can you build a lot of them? Because as far as decarbonization is concerned, the question isn't who's the first to deliver power, it's the first to deliver a lot of power. And to do that, it needs to be cost competitive and not very hard to produce in high volumes. Helion scaling will have some of the same problems as Commonwealth Fusion Systems has, though maybe not as bad. There are a lot of companies that build things similar to their capacitors and other components that they might be able to leverage to scale up quickly. I see fewer elements that will be as hard to scale as the lithium-6 or the superconducting magnets that Commonwealth Fusion Systems will need. But if their base design is 50 megawatts, it would take 20 units to equal 1 gigawatt, which is the output of a typical nuclear fission plant. Even if they were shipping a 50 megawatt plant once a week, it's just a drop in the bucket. So will Fusion be powering data centers this decade? I highly doubt it. But what Helion is doing is real and interesting, and they've made impressive advances. The people investing with them know they'll probably fail, but if they do succeed, Helion will be a trillion dollar company. Since you got to the end, probably makes sense to like and subscribe. If you'd like to support my channel, you can buy me a Guinness. And you can click here to see more of my videos on nuclear fusion. And please forward this video on to anyone you know who doesn't understand the difference between fusion and fission.